you know, they just kind of challenge us intellectually. I think it leaves a lot to the imagination, and it also is very stimulating intellectually. And I think that's why we all gravitate to this art form. So back to my story. I was hoping that I would make a way, my way, into animation. I grew up on Hanna-Barbera and Warner Brothers and Disney and all that stuff. Had a very big influence on me creatively, certainly as a choreographer, as a writer, as a dialogue writer. Uh, all of those art forms have played significantly into my craft and my profession. And I just knew somehow I had been collecting all of these voices. I, you might have heard a few of them. And I, I didn't know how I was going to take those voices and find a way into animation uh, without some major break. And everybody in their careers, and we will all experience this many times in life, have moments where things just kind of come together and you're in flow and uh, stuff, doors start to open. I had one of those moments when uh, a very close friend of mine who was a live sound engineer for big arena concerts. When he wasn't on tour, he would work out of a studio in Hollywood called Harmony Gold. Uh, actually, that was the production company that was working through Intersound. The studio was called Intersound Studios. And they would do a lot of international dubbing for foreign films. We dubbed them into English. And I wasn't a part of the team yet. But he said, you know, with all those crazy people living inside your head that you have so many voices for, you should come down and check out what we do. And I was like, yes, um, sure, I'll come down and check it out, okay. And um, so I went in and I was observing these auditions and I felt like, God, this is something I could do. They were showing this amazing animation and this artwork and it was very sci-fi and futuristic and I've never seen anything like it. And I was just dying for a chance to have a crack at it, but I was there to observe. And then suddenly there was a break in the schedule. Somebody didn't show up for their audition or was late. And they turned around and said, would your friend like to audition? <laughs> the clouds parted and the golden rays of uh, the anime gods shone down on me. And, and I went in and I gave it a crack. And um, this is before, those of you who know audio, I guess everybody kind of knows Pro Tools now, right? How many of you have heard of Pro Tools, the software that we use for recording? Not unusual for, it's actually a music program, but we kind of hijacked it for dialogue recording and it's our exclusive way of recording now, where you have a series of beeps. You hear beep, 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 begin. So it's very rhythmic. Well, at this time, they didn't even have that uh, digital format. It was all analog. And we used these big, real, real, massive tapes, and they were half inch or, or two inch tape. It depended on what we were recording. And um, I went in and I, I they just said, watch the time codes. We have a time code rolling that tells you how many frames and minutes and how, what hour you're into the programming that you're watching. And that SEMPTI code, that time code, was actually developed by NASA. It's this really cool, it's almost like a, a MIDI, how, uh, for those of you that are musicians or know music, um, it's the way that music interfaces with other digital equipment. Well, the SEMPTI code is a way for the machinery to be able to line up and stay in sync with the images that you're seeing on screen. So you, you used to have to watch the time code, and it's just rolling really, really fast. And then you know that your line begins on, say, um, 22 minutes, 15 frames. So you have to watch for that. You see 20, 21, 22, speak. You have to start talking and make your mouth match that sync. So I thought, oh shoot, I missed it, let me try again. And I, I felt like I was getting a little better, a little better. I was like, oh gosh, I'd love to do this. It's just the coolest art form. So I was hoping I'd get a chance to come back and observe and maybe take another crack at it. And about three weeks, you know, it was longer than that. I think it was like six weeks, maybe two months later, I got a phone call out of nowhere saying that I'd been cast in this production that I auditioned for, my very first audition, and it was for a little title called Robotech. Carl Masek, producer of 
producer that uh, kind of had the whole vision for Robotech in his head, and we just lost him a year ago. It was a very untimely, tragic loss. We didn't expect that to happen at all. And uh, very painful, especially personally for me, because he sort of took me out of the chorus and started giving me bigger roles and started uh, grooming me for leads. And he, one of the first things I think I did was Nadia at the Blue Water, where she had that very exotic um, accent, which I think a lot of people hated. <laughs> I think they redid it. But it was a wonderful experience to be working with sort of a, the mind of a master who understood anime and understood the fans and understood uh, the Eastern storytelling art form. And he opened a uh, anime manga store in uh, Orange County, Southern California. And he started to really see that the people uh, in speaking English, the English speaking community really wanted this content and didn't always want to have to read subtitles, but like to be able to watch it in a fluid format. So uh, he's the one that brought Robotech to uh, network TV and it was airing up to five nights a week for a while there. It was very exciting. This is before we had everybody had computers and internet and all that. So there was very little access to anime unless you bought it. And I used to always hear from the fans, oh, I'd love to see your second season of whatever title, but I can't afford to buy it. And that would just break my heart. So without pirating material and, and losing a budget entirely by not paying for content at all, there's now legal ways that you can view things on a number of formats, as you probably know better than me. Um, in a free format that still supports the art form. We had a big um, dip in uh, content coming over from Japan for a few few years because the illegal downloads were just killing our business, just killing us. So you'll hear a lot of voice actors talk about this because we depend on your support to be able to license material to bring it into the States. And um, I got a little overview about your anime club here and that you guys often like to view things that are um, still available in the original language with subtitles, so there's no illegal downloading. That's just a super um, supportive thing and really appreciate it. However, I encourage you to listen to the dogs. <laughs> a little partial. <laughs> so how many of you are from Davis or, or involved in the anime club here? Oh, there's lots of friends. How wonderful. Thank you so much. You guys are instrumental for getting me here, and I appreciate it so much. Um, let's see. Okay, so when I started, there weren't very many women uh, directing and adapting scripts. And when I say adapting, I mean taking a raw translation, adapting it, and localizing to some degree the dialogue into English so it matches the sync. In fact, we pride ourselves in having even better sync than most Japanese studios because in the state, this is always how I explain it to my um, my international clients, that in the, in the U.S. we're used to our entertainment originating in our language, in our mother language, in English. So when anything is dubbed, we lose about 60 to 80 percent of the audience because of the poor dubbing skills in the past. Now with the digital formats that we have and all the amazing things we can do with Pro Tools, we can stretch a waveform. Like if you speak into a, a computer, you, some of you may have seen the waveforms that it transfers the vocal into a visual rep representation, which is an incredible thing for our art form in a number of ways, but especially because we're such a visual, uh, visually driven art form, to be able to see the waveform uh, tells you quickly if something's too dynamic, if the waveform is too long or too wide. Uh, or if there's mouth noise, you'll see like little ticks and glitches, and they're very clear. Sometimes you get a wonderful performance, a wonderful take, and there's mouth noise, or there's a problem. And in the past, we would have to replicate it and do it again and again, also matching the same once again, again and again. Now, uh, since I'm familiar with the editing and ability and capabilities with Pro Tools, I can get a great performance, and the line is too long or too short or has a noise, and my engineer can go in and fix it. I can expand that wavelength so it will actually match the beginning and ending of any given set of mouth flaps. And um, we don't have to put the actor through such grueling, repetitive processes. We can keep the, the performances fresh 
So we want all of our lip sync to look and sound as if the material was born and originated here in the States and was designed for an English speaking audience. That's the trick. And at the same time, we want to get really fantastic performances. So as a director, that's what I focus on, is keeping a really natural sense of the dialogue flowing between the actors, but still technically having a, a really dead on sharp, precise match to the picture. So I always tell people it's a very left brain, right brain kind of art form. It's technical, and you have to be very musical, and you have to be able to syncopate the line and make it all fit. But at the same time, you have to be super fluid and creative and in the moment and laid back or high energy or whatever the character demands. So I'm kind of uh, jumping around here. But after a while of being in voiceover and uh, the community embracing me, it was something that just really came together for me very progressively. Slowly at first, quicker over the years, and then I shifted all of my attention to being a full-time voice artist and adapter and director, casting director, and things really started to click. I started, uh, I think the first show, yes, the first show I directed on was a live action show, was Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Yeah! <laughs> so popular, it's just amazing after all these years. So my very first role on that show was Scorpina, who was that gorgeous, evil Japanese gorgeous girl. We tried to get the actual actress to come out from Japan so we could shoot more series and more episodes with her, but we could never locate her. That was really unfortunate. Uh, but she was sort of a second to Rita Repulsa, the amazing Miss Barbara Goodson. And um, I started directing ADR for that whenever the Power Rangers were in their helmets. All that stuff is dubbed. <gasps> Sorry, spoiler. <laughs> and, uh, so um, I had one of uh, my first directing sessions was with Johnny Bosch when he was all of maybe 18 or 19 years old. It was so great. And um, so we uh, spent many years working on those shows. We had several primetime young adult shows. Um, VR Troopers. Let's see, I think I was uh, Magno, the, the talking car. Step on the gas, we're out of here. We even had a toy, I have this little red car, push the button, and my voice is all like, Step on the gas, we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Still have it. And uh, I had to get a, a special, like, uh, what do you call it, uh, a display case for all my toys, so I could, like, I cruise all the, uh, the dealer's rooms and look for toys for my characters and stuff. And, um, let's see, after that, what else? We had Air Troopers, Sweet Valley High, Beetleborgs, there were a number of those Saban. Fox, uh, later Disney productions that we did. And then, um, and I say we because in, in Los Angeles there's a large core of really solid talent, but out of maybe three, four hundred people, there's probably a hundred of us that work all the time, and out of that hundred people, there's probably 20 guys and 20 girls that you hear again and again on so many titles because they're so versatile, they're so good, and dependable, and fun to work with. Having fun in the studio is a big part of what we do. Whenever my husband observes a session, he's like, yeah, hard job. <laughs> it's like, well, we laugh our butts off, but we're still working. I mean, sometimes we're working, you know, 10, 12 hour days. It can be really grueling sessions, but, you know, when you love what you're doing, that's the key. That's the key to really finding longevity in a career that you're pursuing. And I, I wish that for all of you, is just to follow your passion and find what you love and turn it into a business. Um, yeah, I had to spend a lot of years sacrificing to get to that place, so it's no easy ride, especially for women. There's always more work for men. And that's why I learned to pick up some male voices like Yahiko of the Comic Machine style. So, uh, he's got a big crush on Kenshin, doesn't he? Um, picking up some male roles really helps for, for female actors because there's so many roles for men. The theory is that boys will watch, and men, will watch male content with male leads, but that they won't necessarily follow female leads, although I think that's changing. And that women and girls will follow a male lead and a female lead, so the majority wins, and most of the stuff is, most of the stories that we get, not just in animation, but in general, is male-driven. So, um, so when I got to play um, TK, the smallest of us, 
up to two months. He was my fairest little guy ever.